this point. Okay, uh, let's talk about Sarbanes-Oxley. The Ethics Resource Center has some disturbing news on the state of workplace misconduct at some of America's most powerful companies. The timing of the survey coincides with the upcoming 10-year anniversary of the business reform law Sarbanes-Oxley. And joining us now, Mr. Oxley, Michael Oxley, former U.S. Congressman and Chairman of the nonpartisan nonprofit Ethics Resource Center. Um, Congressman, let, let's go through the results of the survey, uh, but more importantly, 10 years later, what do you think of the law that you created? Well, I think the, uh, it stood the test of time. Um, we've never had a systemic failure like we've had with Enron and WorldCom and some of the other businesses that uh, went bankrupt uh, early in the part of the uh, 20th, 21st century. So I think from that standpoint, it's been uh, obviously effective. The key now, Rye, is what we, the Ethics Resource Center and the study that we've done on the Fortune 500 companies and how uh, some of the success they've had and some of the failures they've had. And that's really what we're going to concentrate on uh, in that report. Right. Congressman, do you think back 10 years, 10 years later, do, do you think that, that the law was too backward looking? And I say it in the context that obviously, while we haven't had another Enron or, or um, WorldCom, in that respect, we also had the financial crisis. And, and, and in large part, people would suggest that was about uh, mismarking of numbers, uh, different valuations, things like that. No, Sarbanes Oxley was really about accounting fraud and uh, didn't have really anything to do with the, the uh, problems we've had in the last few years in the financial community. There are two different, uh, two different things and two different approaches. And one of, one of the, the criticisms or the critiques of the law that I hear often, especially among small businesses, but also among big businesses, is the cost. Everybody says it just costs too much. Uh, to comply and that ultimately it doesn't change the outcome. What do you say to that? Well, it does, of course, change the outcome because the idea was to restore investor confidence uh, in companies uh, that uh, they were worried about. And, and I think that, that has had a major effect. The cost has um, uh, receded a number of, for a number of years now. The recent study by the uh, Center for Audit Quality indicated a 30 percent reduction in the cost between 2006 and 2008. And those numbers keep coming down. I think it's true that there was the initial costs uh, were uh, were not in uh, in line with uh, with expectations. But I think over time uh, we've adopted to that. The point is now we have a a strong uh, ethical compliance um, uh, uh, measurement in, in in corporate America, and I think we're starting to see some uh, good results from that. I, I don't want to be dismissive of that at all. And obviously, I think it, you know the the ethics element of this is is crucial. Uh, but I'll give you an anecdote. I was talking to uh, a board member of a, a small company, a public, publicly traded. They say they spend about $4 million a year uh, on compliance. And they said, look, we actually had to let go. We had to fire uh, some of the people who answered the telephones for us literally to comply. Uh, how, do you, how do you resolve that for yourself? Well, I think that um, I don't know the particular particulars of that, but I know a lot of other companies that uh, have adopted those uh, high uh, standards have set a, a good tone at the top uh, and are doing exceptionally well. So um, I don't think we can take one particular case and, and I don't know what their revenues are, I don't know what their market cap is. But the point is that, that the idea was to provide more transparency and accountability uh, in the public markets and I think that was a successful. And the fact is we've not had a systemic failure like Enron and WorldCom. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the investors feel much more comfortable right. Uh, having those uh, in place. Uh, Congressman Oxley, uh, Professor uh, Jeremy Siegel is on the set with us. He's got a question for you. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, I was a recent uh, article in the Wall Street Journal uh, that showed that uh, compliance costs for small companies per employee was five times greater than for the large ones. And I think that, you know, the, and most of, the, most of that increase over the last 10 years was Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, do you think that there's some way that it could be modified to lower those costs on the small businesses? I think, I think the law is very much applicable and done a good job for those multi-billion dollar businesses. But what about the smaller businesses? Well, as you know, the Congress passed the JOBS Act, which uh, startup companies now uh, will be relieved of some of those, uh, those costs. But I think more importantly, the SEC has addressed uh, some of those issues and continues to do that along with the PCAOB. Uh, in, uh, in getting a more scalable approach, um, a more of a, of a, of a top-down uh, kind of an approach. Uh, it was done uh, under Chris Cox's leadership at the SEC. 
those kind of efforts are continuing. And, and that's a positive thing in my estimation. But I, I, think, I think it was encouraging to look at some of the studies to show that costs overall have been reduced by some 30 percent um, from the original cost uh, that, that went through. Congressman, I've spoken with Jim Chanos in the past, and I know you say that what happened in the financial crisis is a little different than what Sarbanes-Oxley set out to try and define. He has said he's been surprised that no one was was prosecuted under Sarbanes-Oxley because he did think that there was a case, particularly in some of those financial companies, if you look at Lehman or others, for saying that, yeah, they, they weren't living up to what they had told us or what they had signed off on when it came to some of the accounting standards because of precisely that reason, just finding the marks and, and, and marking them fairly. Have you been surprised that it hasn't been used? Not particularly. I think um, clearly the Justice Department felt that they had the uh, necessary evidence they would have gone forward with prosecutions. Um, and I, I just think that uh, there was a, a case and this was an excessive risk. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, there are different things. But in terms of, of accounting fraud, uh, the Justice Department found, at least at this point, uh, found uh, nothing to uh, to indicate that there was that kind of fraud going on. But if, if the goal of Sarbanes-Oxley was to try and restore investor confidence, when you go so, through something like the financial crisis of 2008, and no one does a perp walk, no one is prosecuted, how does that leave investors feeling any more confident about uh, being protected? Well, again, I think we're talking apples and oranges here. I mean, in, in terms of the, uh, clearly, if that, there that's was That's fine. Like, forget about the Sarbanes-Oxley part of this yeah. whole thing. When you oh, come yeah. through it as an investor and you see what's Absolutely. happened, how well, do I mean, you have any faith in this? And, and I think that is true. The individual investor uh, has had some real body blows, uh, beginning with Enron and WorldCom and right. up to the present time, insider trading, uh, the LIBOR problem. I mean, all of those things, I think, have been reflected in the fact that uh, individual investors are very, very wary of the market now. And that's unfortunate because that's really the bedrock of the uh, capitalist system. So, Congressman, if uh, you were back in Washington and you could uh, either update your law or write a new one, is there something you would do? Well, I know law is perfect. Sure, I, I think I would have a more, uh, initially, more of a scaled-down provision that, that would have had uh, um, uh, treated uh, smaller companies different from the larger Fortune 500 companies. Uh, but but in, in many ways, though, we gave the flexibility to the SEC and the PCOB and they've used it somewhat, and I think maybe there's an opportunity to use more of that to, to, to make it work even more effectively. It's a process. It's been 10 years. Uh, obviously, there's some changes that uh, are, are necessary. Um, but I wouldn't want to go back and try to redo it. I think that would be uh, virtually impossible. But I do think the regulators uh, have uh, more of an outlook that, and, and the ability to, to make those kind of changes necessary. Right. Uh, Congressman, before I let you go, I wanted to react to a different survey this morning. Uh, we actually talked about this on the show, I think, about a week ago. Um, there was a survey by a law firm uh, that represents investors and whistleblowers. And uh, the survey came back that 24 percent of Wall Street workers who participated in the study said they believed that unethical or illegal behavior could help people in their industry be successful. And in addition, they said that 26 percent of the respondents said they had actually observed or had first-hand knowledge of wrongdoing in the workplace. Have we really come that far, after all? Well, I mean, I think it depends on how you look at our survey, for example. The uh, National Business Ethics Survey um, would indicate that, uh, for example, 13 percent of the reporters uh, talked about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act violation. That is a clear case of, obviously, bribery that you can, you can quantify. So. Um, but you know, that, those kind of things continue. You're never going to get a perfect kind of a system. People are going to try to game the system for their own advantage. Uh, the idea, again, is to have more transparency out there and more accountability, but you're never going to get to 100 percent. Okay. Michael Oxley, thank you for being here on this 10-year anniversary of Sarbanes-Oxley. My pleasure. Thank you. you. Thank you.